welcome to this session on international space law where i will be discussing uh, introduction to space law for those who are not aware then discuss uh, emerging issues that space law today and the world today facing and then finally move on to a need for a national domestic space legislation as you are aware that space is not going to be uh, concentrated for one country therefore there always is going to be a requirement for international space laws as well as domestic space laws we can begin with uh, the introduction of space itself then we will discuss a slight history on how space exploration brought about the need for governance of space and then in this slide then we will finally move to the first instances of international space law so let's start the discussion now space or outer space to be more specific is what the english language calls as an uncountable noun space as widely understood is defined as any region beyond the atmosphere of the earth now that being said the definition is rather inconclusive because it springs up several other questions now mankind throughout history has learned that answers must be found out either by way of speculation calculation or postulation which thereafter has to be produced with an evidentiary conclusion now space has been always associated with a lot of science and even more so fictional science Sci both science and fictional science have flirted with our limitation of imagination to be pushed harder and farther one such historic science fictional author visionary or like how i like to call him an eccentric storyteller was jules verne you might relate to mr jules verne through his uh, novels which have been adapted as movies uh, the amazing journey to the center of the earth so as the eccentricity in that movie is the same is in space and jules verne was the first individual to romanticize the idea which became a reality only a century later of mankind's first entry into space while we call this the speculative aspect of space law or exploration of space a postulation in 1910 was put forth by one emil lord a belgian legal expert who asserted that there exists a layer of breathable air on the earth however there exists layers of unbreathable air beyond this breathable layer of air and man one day will ascend to that layer those layers will need governance air laws will not apply they will need special laws called space laws now while we are discussing space laws in a parallel university we must discuss the journey air law has embarked interestingly it followed the similar pattern in a time back in history when people believed nothing apart from birds could fly the right brothers in 1903 introduced engine power flight now this created quite a stir in the international community of enthusiasts and further intrigued a community of jurists and postulators now this situation eventually concluded to it to the aviation industries first convention being the paris convention in 1919 the agreement that was concluded then concentrated on the roman tenet of complete sovereignty over superjacent air above an above a country or a state's air now this principle quickly attained the status of dogma now in fact to be very honest it was not until the year of 1926 that space law was even put forth as a separate legal category an official of the soviet air ministry by the name v a zarzar questioning the applicability of aviation laws to space preferred a research paper and suggested that there has to be an upper limit to state sovereignty and that a separate legal regime has to be introduced to be, to deal with the arena beyond this upper zone where international flight travel and interplanetary communication would be free from control of the states and countries on earth now come to the 19th and 20th century the turning point of space exploration 
you had the events of launching of the Zeppelin, launching of Sputnik 1 in 1957, Yuri Gagarin being the first man to enter space, and of course, 1969, Neil Armstrong becoming the first man in history to have stepped onto a galactic entity, the moon. Now it has become indispensable that the dark matter beyond uh, the commercial flight reach had to be governed by principle and laws since human intrusion was evident. Now this applicability of air law and conventions and you know laws of countries being applied to space was already becoming a lockjam for the United Nations General Assembly and therefore a decision was reached that any activity and every activity in space will only be convened and allowed and be conducted for peaceful purposes and through international cooperation. This principle or this understanding of the UN General Assembly was crystallized by way of a resolution which paved way for the UNCOPUS or the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Along with this, in 1961 itself, a milestone in space law was achieved. Another resolution of the United Nations was adopted which recognized that exploration and use of outer space should be only for the betterment of mankind and to benefit of states irrespective of the status of their economic or scientific development. Furthermore, two fundamental principles were crystallized as primary foundation stones of international space law. The first being that even in space, international law including the UN Charter, would apply to both space and celestial bodies. And the second, that outer space and celestial bodies are free for exploration and use by all states in conformity with international laws and are not subject to national appropriation of any kind. This finally brought in the declaration of legal principles governing activities of states in exploration and use of outer space. And finally, the Outer Space Treaty, which we will discuss further in this session. We will discuss fundamentals of international space law. But before that, let's take a view at this clip. This is the 1969 milestone which I was discussing where Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Now, this clip itself will bring in a lot of questions to you. Doesn't that US national flag mean national appropriation and this clip itself has raised so many more conspiracies than a claim but leaving that to another side this has been a milestone in space exploration and one cannot deny it now the next is actually the fundamentals of international space law now fundamentals of international space law are based on five treaties as you can see in the slide and certain principles of international space law We'll go by through it one after another. But we need to understand what was the intention behind concluding these treaties. My discussion further will enlighten you on that. Now, international space law has quite different fundamentals. They have been formulated by the legal subcommittee, UNCOPUS, like I previously mentioned, in the following manner. There is a prohibition on national appropriation of outer space and celestial bodies. All states and countries have been given equal rights of economic and scientific advancement and exploration, freedom of scientific research, prevention of sovereign rights of states over uh, you know, uh, space objects launched by them. You cannot take away the sovereignty of a country over the space object launched by them once it enters space. The sovereignty and the jurisdiction is retained. And collaboration, if any, of states for cooperation in rendering assistance to crew of spaceships in emergencies and rescue missions. Now, before we delve further, there is a controversy that has always persisted. Each discussion of space law and precluded and preceded each inauguration of debate of these treaties, which is state sovereignty versus absolute freedom of space. The solution to this is rather unresolved until date. The question actually is whether there is an upper limit of state sovereignty measurable in terms of actual distance. This is unresolved, like I said. However, it is undisputed that there does exist an upper limit to state sovereignty. In other words, it is accepted 
that there is no infinity to vertical sovereignty of a state as is restricted horizontally on the earth. Of course, it is beyond doubt that customary international law in terms of the ICJ, the International Courts of Justice Statute, and recognition of what is moral, morality, certain immoral acts are always considered criminal offenses, ipso facto, regardless of the fact whether there exists a codified law or not. Examples of such acts would be an act of murder, an act of sabotage. Now, these are always going to be considered illegal acts when mankind is concerned. So finally, coming to the five treaties. Now, these five treaties have been brought in with a certain legislative intent, if, you, if I may say so. The first one, the Outer Space Treaty in 1961, has ratifications of 105 states and 25 signing nations. This treaty sets the constitutive foundations for all exploration of outer space. It is the broadest of all treaties specific to space and is also considered to be the father of all other treaties. And all other treaties relating to space are considered supplements to the Outer Space Treaty. Most of the space uh, exploration activities in outer space are governed under the articles of the Outer Space Treaty. In the discussion that follows, you will understand the applicability, the significance and importance of the Outer Space Treaty and much of the other treaties that I'm going to enlist and discuss with you uh, briefly in this slide. The next one is Rescue and Return Agreement. With 95 ratifications and 25 signing nations, the Rescue and Return Agreement provides for rest return of astronauts in distress and of space objects to their original landing authorities or launching authorities in the event they are found in different jurisdictions. Now, this applies when there is an unfortunate situation like the Apollo 13, where uh, uh, our Indian astronaut, uh, late Kalpana Chawla, demised a crash a recovery of mortal remains recovery of any surviving crew and recovery of crash remains for that matter are governed under this rescue and return agreement now we are all students of science we are all students of logic we are all students of law and we understand that what goes up must eventually calm down the liability convention protects a situation in this regard the Liability Convention with 94 ratifications and 20 signing nations defines circumstances in which a launching state is liable for a space object, deals with the case of multiple launching states and the liabilities in this situation, and describes how a claim against these launching states may be brought about in the event another state, another entity has suffered damages or harm by operation of their rights by operation of the launching states rights the liability convention also provides for an establishment of an ad hoc claims commission to settle between two or more states a little more detail of this uh, about this uh, convention that i can discuss is there is a time limit for claim a claim can be brought about only in a one year time frame nothing beyond one year is uh, entertained you can call it the limitation period of claims in terms of the liability convention. Secondly, is a very interesting aspect. We are all aware that activities of space cost millions and billions of dollars or the local currency of a participating nation. When it comes to the liability convention, there is no quantum that has been associated or a calculative formula that has been provided for how much damage can be recovered by a claiming nation. This becomes a very difficult situation where the liability, liable nation has to face unquantifiable or unliquidable uh, claims. And there is no mechanism to see the merit of such a claim. Uh, this becomes a dispute and is dealt with in a particular manner, which I will take up in further in these slides. The Registration Convention is the next one, which was signed in 1975. 
deals with a compulsory registration of every space mission and space object that is going to be launched into space. It's like I would call it in colloquial terms, the RTO of space for all the countries. Each space mission has to be given a particular name. Each space shuttle has to be given a nomenclature. And each program has to be given a particular registration ID. And finally, we come to the Moon Agreement. The Moon Agreement with 18 ratifications and four signing nations, however, is one of the most important and the latest uh, treaty in space law. It covers not just the Moon, but all celestial bodies known to man. It expands on several articles of the Out Outer Space Treaty itself, including Article 1, which descri describes exploration of and use of Outer Space Treaty as a common province of humanity, basis of equality, and also Article 2, that no state may claim sovereignty over any part of space, and Article 4, which significantly limits military activities on space, celestial bodies, and the moon. The Moon Agreement further provides extra detail about the specific mode of cooperative use and most significantly foreshadows an international regime to be settled among parties for exploration of natural resources of Moon and the celestial bodies. This becomes relevant when we discuss mining in space, which again I will take up further in this session. We will come to the very existence and undisputable and undeniable principles of international space law. Now, if you will go through these principles, you will find that they have been brought about for a protective intent, for a uh, intention of resolving any disputes that may occur, and they have been given a guardian. The guardian is the UN General Assembly's office called the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs or UNUSA, as we colloquially call it. Now, briefly going through these principles, you will see something that I've been saying for quite some time. There is a delimitation between airspace and outer space, but it is yet not legally defined. All three, all states are used, uh, are free to use and explore outer space. The exploration of outer space has to be for benefit in the interest of all countries. It is a common province or a common field of play for mankind. There cannot be national appropriation of space. All international laws apply to outer space, not just space-specific treaties. This is important. No weapons of mass destruction are to be placed in outer space. Interestingly, however, there is no restriction on conventional weapons. Furthermore, outer space generally and specifically must be used for non-aggressive purposes. The moon and other celestial bodies are subject to specific peaceful purposes uses restrictions. These principles also talk about how a state can be claimed for its fault in terms of collision, in terms of uh, spaces fall, uh, space objects falling out of orbit and crashing into la uh, lands and countries, etc. If you have gone through these, now where there is law, there is a dispute that needs to be adjudicated. In fact, I believe where there is a congregation of people, congregation of minds, disagreements and disputes are a natural aftermath. The disputes often arise from tangential mindsets, egotistical ideologies and theologies. A situation where sovereignty is limited, questions are bound to rise and where answers are not likable, challenges are inevitable. So to begin with, let's settle this question many might have. There are no space courts, special courts or galactic courts. These, this, uh, these disputes, these disagreements <coughs> are subject to the one and only jurisdiction that deals with international law, that is the international courts of justice. The lack of a dispute settlement regime for international space law does lead to an unprecedented opportunity for the law relating to international dispute settlement in terms of, like I said, uh, there is no calculative formula for claims. In a situation where there is a private entity involved in space activity and a nation has suffered, what is going to be the situation there? Now, several disputes may occur, like you can see on the slides. 
this would require invocation of national legislatures eventually for governing activities out of space and look into the merits of the case for applicability of statutes per se. So these disputes can range from insurance laws, claims for damages, invocation of force major, which are interstate jurisdiction and interference of conducting activities into outer space, breach of principles causing injury on the international scale of jurisdiction. Suffice it to say, the Supreme Courts of each state would be empowered to dispense justice for domestic disputes and the ICJ would preside over international disputes. The dispute resolution mechanism as of today is the same mechanism that is applied for other earthly disputes that arise between countries. Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty preempts any state from beginning or commencing an international uh, space program without getting into, uh, without, not without consulting other states or other participants. This is called the negotiation mechanism. Now that we have come abreast with what disputes could arise in space, let's come to the burning issue or the emerging issues of international space laws. We'll bring you up abreast with what are the emerging issues as of 2020. Now, like I have discussed before, there is a current understanding that there cannot be military use of space. However, many countries are attempting to partially bring in military usage or bringing partial dem demilitarization of outer space. Now, quoting from the Outer Space Treaty, Article 1 itself, the space is a common province of all mankind. It can therefore prove to be the most advantageous and vantage positions for any military action or military preparedness for a country. This itself brings about the necessity for prevention of an arms race and demilitarization of outer space in the common interest of all. Security in outer space has emerged as a foremost concern for international community. Recent times have seen a rapid increase in activities relating to the development of instruments for military purposes. And it becomes relevant to examine the state of affairs in this regard as the potential feasibility of a space war has come to view. You know, there were times when we discussed there could be a world war. There were times we could discuss that there could be a second world war. Today we are discussing there could be a nuclear war. Right now we are discussing there could be an ongoing bio warfare. There is a time which is far where we will discuss space war. I am not talking about Star Wars. I am not talking about Star Trek, but I am talking about the wars of satellites. Now the part demilitarization of space results into putting up orbit orbiting satellites for reconnaissance or espionage of encrypted telecommunication, space surveillance and eavesdropping. The militarization and weaponization of space towards deterrent, a strategy written of, uh, there, there is a commission called the Strategy and International Affairs Commission in 2007, quoted that these technologies contribute to the strategy of states which possess military assets in space and provide logical support and logistical support to their troops deployed in operational theaters. They do not, however, part, form part of any armament per se, but with the purpose of neutralizing or destroying the enemy capacities, these form a vital role. Now, Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty was enacted and ratified by nations, which dealt with military technology. I'm reading out Article 4 for your, for your understanding. There is a situation that I will discuss after I read this out. Article 4 states that states parties to the treaty undertake not to place in orbit around the earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. The states also undertake not to install such weapons on celestial bodies or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. The moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all state parties to the treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes. The establishment of military bases 
installations and fortifications, testing of any weapons, and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden. The use of military personnel for scientific research or for any other peaceful purposes shall not be prohibited. The use of any equipment or facility necessary for peaceful exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies shall also not be prohibited. Now, the Soviet Union, after the space launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957, and the US of A after reaching the moon in 1969 were amidst a power tussle to be called superpowers of space. They are, they are amidst a power tussle down here in Earth also, but in space, they have advancements. The space activities of US also have brought in a lot of questioning to their in to their intention behind demilitarization and stability of demilitarization. The USSR initially stated that peaceful in international laws always meant non-military since the International Treaty of Antarctica in 1959 and the Treaty on Non-Proliferation non of Nuclear Weapons, as well as the United Nations Charter defined peaceful methods of solving international disputes are not with the use of armed forces. After the launch of the Sputnik in 1957, the Soviets changed their approach for what appeared to be an interpretation of complete demilitarization. The Soviets stated that paragraph 2 of article 4 had already demilitarized the moon and celestial bodies and that paragraph 1 was an important step towards banning the use of all outer space for military purposes. The USSR distinguished between activity where the military is employed and activity with a military character since paragraph 2 of article 4 specifically allowed the use of military personnel for peaceful purposes. By comparison, United States position was based on the interpretation of peaceful use as non-aggressive rather than non-military activity. The United States had maintained this position consistently ever since the beginning of space era. This has been seen as a play to gain international recognition of the legality of reconnaissance satellites, espionage on different countries, while simultaneously discouraging military space activities that threatened these activities that carried out reconnaissance. According to this definition, peaceful use as used in the space treaty denoted non-aggressive activity in the traditional international legal sense, where aggressive is considered as an attack or undermining another state's territorial sovereignty. There is a definite understanding from all of this that weapons of mass destruction are not going to be allowed in space in near future or until any other particular war-based treaty is concluded. United Nations Charter Article 2, sub-Article 4 provides that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Now, this is always going to apply to space. Therefore, a chance of a space war, although eminent, is quite, quite far away. The next issue I'm going to discuss is spatial and celestial mining. Detailed astrology has revealed that, uh, I, I beg your pardon, detailed astrogeology has revealed that the celestial bodies and asteroids are rich of resources. Immediately, the question does arise that if someone does mine these resources, who owns the material from these celestial bodies? This is an answer that is still remains unresolved as the clock stick. The technological advance in most fields are due to either privatization or collaboration with private entities and organizations. While these marvels back on Earth are supervised by territorial jurisdictions, sovereignty and intellectual property laws, the outer space is beyond the very reach of these three aforesaid terms. It is undisputed mantra, the outer space is beyond national appropriation and that no man can own any celestial body or part of space and make a claim thereof. Now, attempting to resolve this lockjam, there is a Space Settlement Institute in New York, which has 
it, it is actually an advocacy group that proposes a congress congressional legislation titled the space settlement act the space settlement act proposes legal support for land ownership on celestial bodies now this itself is a breach of the principles as we have understood them as of now however the us senate and the us courts are in consideration of of uh, bringing in such laws which allow private entities to claim certain lands both in celestial bodies and available in space now celestial mining has also opened another can of worms with regard to the analysis of the mined minerals most minerals are known to the geological world but the outer space does offer plenty unknown minerals and their effects are yet not properly tested or established combining them with existing materials may bring in scientific anomaly which has to be discussed which has to be tested at large before anything on a global commercial scale can be brought about i move on to the next emerging issue that is space tourism most of us today will be aware of what space tourism is thanks to mr musk or mr uh, richard gear both bringing in spacex and virgin galactic the arrival of space tourism or more appropriately in space laws private space flight requires law of the outer space to change and adapt to this revolutionary development as deriving precisely from the principle private participation in these activities space tourism is often hailed as giving rise to a revolution in the accessibility of humans to the hostile and in principle endless realm of outer space you can think of everything one space tourism is allowed colonization of mars a constitution of mars moving to saturn bringing about uh, you know a colony on titan the biggest moon of saturn all of this can be discussed but currently the laws that govern space are not equipped to deal with such kind of ingress of humans that are not trained that are not inclining towards research oriented method methodology now private space flight is defined as flights of humans intended to enter outer space at their own expense or that of another private person or entity conducted by private entities or both it thus hinges on two alternative specific criteria setting it apart from other that more traditional space activities are to apply for space research or betterment of mankind it is this fundamentally private character of space tourism that sets apart the entire concept from space law space tourism faces not only technological risks but also liability issues the current liability convention or the current space treaties refer only to assisting and rescuing astronauts and space objects the international space station partner states and the us national legislation make a clear distinction between professional astronauts and space flight participants article 5 of the 1968 rescue agreement addresses nearly exclusively the return of astronauts and space objects the assistance to astronauts and the obligation to inform other states and the un secretary of any phenomena liable to constitute a danger to the life or health of astronauts in space astronauts have the legal obligation to help other astronauts but the countries have no such obligation overall the agreement enshrines the immunity of astronauts the conflict or true inconsistency arises when the term astronaut is used for scientific or semi military trained personnel inserted into outer space to carry out research or assist astronomy by most nations that are involved in the space program however article 10 of the moon treaty introduces astronaut as any person on the moon therefore while a codified definition is absent such conflicting stances can cause several liability and jurisdictional issues the interesting part that does come up is why the moon treaty itself puts restriction on privatization of the moon and celestial bodies it still it still postulates or envisages a non research non semi military trained personnel to land on the surface of the celestial body the rescue treaty brings upon the responsibility on each state to rescue and assist astronauts as recognized by the states 
and therefore in the event of a private individual in need of assistance would have to be first granted a refugee status or be termed an, as an illegal uh, illegal immigrant status for the jurisdiction that they have infiltrated now therefore virgin galactic and spacex and other such corporations providing and proposing privatization of outer space and gathering immense acclaim and postulating a world of transport and tourism beyond airspace into suborbital space the impact on already tense and shrinking applicability of laws are creating ripples in the international space community to gather and unify on new laws treaties and legislations that govern such private traffic this evolution is required and will come in times as we see if we move on to the next slide we will discuss a widely discussed topic right now called force majeure but this is going to be in relation to space now this is a technological impasse force majeure is a clause or a provision in a contract that indemnifies a party from not performing its contractual obligations with a reason that the performance of the obligation has become impossible or impracticable due to an event or effect that the parties could not have anticipated or controlled these events include natural disasters such as floods earthquakes and other acts of gods as well as uncontrollable events such as war or terrorist attacks the un law commission defines it as the impossibility of acting legally is the situation when an unforeseen event outside the will of the party invoking it makes it absolutely impossible to comply with its international obligation under the principle that no one is obliged to do the impossible the liability convention of 1972 establishes a dual system of liability first it provides that a launching state has the absolute responsibility to pay compensation for damages caused to the surface of the earth or to an aircraft in flight and secondly it provides that in the event damage caused other than on the surface of the earth to a space object of a launching state or to persons or property on board such space object by another space object of a launching state the latter is only liable if the damage is attributable to fault therefore an exemption from liability cannot be provided for in the agreement if a natural disaster is the cause of an accident by, caused by a space object the general feeling was that by exonerating the launching state from its responsibility in such circumstances the effects of the principle of absolute responsibility would be would be would be vitiated however when it comes to space activities certain aspects of the problems of the responsibility acquire greater importance in particular cases of force major which are likely to multiply due to possibility and of encounters with meteors or as a result of malfunction or the accidental stopping of onboard guiding devices the question of exemption due to force majeure was therefore examined by a committee on the peaceful uses of outer space and its legal subcommittee in connection with proposed present with this proposal presented in 1965 by hungary which mentioned natural disasters in its agreement a portion or an extract which i am going to read out from the draft of the hungarian agreement is that if the damage has occurred on the ground or in the atmosphere the exemption of responsibility can be granted only to the extent that the responsible state produces proof that the damage resulted from a natural disaster or from an intentional act or gross negligence of the state victim of damage therefore the sudden appearance of an asteroid or comet might have possibly been force majeure at the start of the space era but it is no longer the case today it is relatively easier to track down a trajectory of an asteroid or assess the regular trajectory of a comet technology has advanced so much that you can predict weather for months together you can predict situations of celestial situations of asteroids or uh, space projectiles as i would call it the uh, predicting the trajectory however what remains unpredictable are solar flares the weather of the sun is still difficult to predict in the long run a violent and unforeseen solar flare by astronomers suggests it would damage the very functioning of the satellite or the spacecraft itself this would is would be and remains to be a classic illustration of force major in outer space the explosion of a supernova could also con constitute a case of force major similarly already 
orbiting space debris, space junk, as it is colloquially called in the lower Earth orbit, not listed because it is less than 10 centimeters in size, could cause substantial damage to a satellite or even compromise a launch. Research suggests and even has concluded that a tiny fleck of paint revolving at terminal velocity or orbiting at terminal velocity in the lower Earth orbit can be disastrous for a satellite. Now, finally, on the case of force major in space law, perhaps more imaginatively although, a spacecraft is skipped beyond control and collides with another spacecraft or a satellite. Such event would cause a case of force major, be it governed by the li uh, liability convention. The idea, therefore, of considering this fictitious risk to release the responsibility of state is strictly necessary, all the more that it is necessary to consider the probability of enormous disasters or damages up in space. Finally, moving to the most important issue is environment of the outer space. As mankind has successfully degraded and destroyed the environment in Earth, we are also successfully moving into destroying the environment in the outer space. Now, space may seem like a vast untapped resource, a new world where attempts at alternate, alternate colonization can be planned out. But the moon, planets and other bodies in our solar system are pristine places of stark beauty. Now, in 2009, a US communication satellite pristine the Iridium-33 experienced unprecedented orbital collision, collision where it crashed into a defunct Russian cosmat named the Cosmos 2251. The two objects collided and created thousands of tiny shreds of debris which are still floating around. The event brought, international, brought international attention to the fact that the space around Earth is a junk pile. More than 300,000 bits of litter larger than one centimeter surrounding our planet including old satellite fragments spent rockets, and like I mentioned, flecks of paints, nuts and bolts, discarded astronaut gloves, spatulas, cameras, space tools, and crystals of frozen excretory products of astronauts form this junk. These form a ring around the, of debris and pose a danger to the satellites and humans on International Space Station and are starting to interfere with rocket launches which have to avoid running into stray space traps on the way up. As more and more junk accrues, it increasingly collides with the other rubbish, shattering into smaller pieces that creates a Kessler syndrome. Now, the Kessler syndrome is recognized as spent rockets, satellites and other space trash that have accumulated in orbit, increasing the likelihood of collision with other debris. Collisions create more debris, creating a runaway chain reaction of collisions and more debris known as the, is known as the Kessler syndrome. It was proposed by Donald Kessler and therefore has been named after him. Space junk is a classical example of the tragedy of commons. Now one may ask, what is the tragedy of commons? This is a theory that is postulated and published in 1968 by Garrett Harding. This theory states that individuals acting rationally and independently according to their own self-interest will deplete a shared resource. Even if, the con even if it is contrary to the best interest of the group, the example is individual farmers who let their animals graze openly. Eventually, at one point of time, there will be no grass to graze. This is the det detrimental so situation for our society. Space organizations around the world have been treating the orbit, orbits around the Earth just like Haddon's grazed land, operating under the big sky theory. The sky is too big, there can never be a chance of any collision. But as the space commons become more and more crowded, collision is also picking up. Because things are spinning around at such vicious velocities, even small objects can cause huge amounts of damage. Forward contamination can render all prospects of research and exploration futile. Outer Space Treaty demands every state to avoid exploration in a ma manner to cause adverse changes from introduction of extraterrestrial matter. Now, you might not know, but there exists on Earth something called as the spacecraft symmetry. It is a place 
off the coast of New Zealand at the point called Point Nemo in the South Pacific Ocean uninhabited area called the Spawa. Here, planned deorbiting of satellites takes place. All failed satellites or unpredicted crashes have been tried and navigated to this area. This area is full of space junk. Cleaning of this area is now becoming a task for all countries. The race to reach the outer space, a lot of countries have the farthest participants and have reached much advanced stages. But to contain this environment, to prohibit and preserve forward contamination, the participants are very few. It is loathsome that most nations leading the outer space exploration programs are, the, are riddling the outer space environment with objects that degrade it and are in fact breaching the true concept of international space law, which is preservation of all mankind. This brings me to the last part of my discussion and session today. The next we'll discuss the need for a national space legislation. Now, we must understand what is a national space legislation. The national space legislation is the tool to implement the international obligations of states, the treaties at a national level, and to make sure that all private commercial non-governmental entities are carrying out space activities in conformity with international space law. A national space legislation can bring about uniformities in consist and consistencies in international law. It embodies and crystallizes national interests ensures safety of space legislation and also ensures the safety of the space and state that is exploring it. India's relationship with space dates back to the 1960s when the first rocket was launched under the guidance of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Since then, the country's advancement in the realm of space has put it on the path towards becoming a space superpower. The establishment of Indian space research organization ISRO was one of his greatest achievements. He has successfully convinced the government that there has to be a developing space program even for a developing country. However, currently the legal framework that is supporting India's space ventures are dated and are hardly space oriented, if I may say so. Satellite thousand and the remote sensing data policy of 2001 are one of the few uh, legislatures that are currently governing India's space ventures. There is no participation or very li limited participation from the private sector in space ventures and government still holds pure monopoly in this regard. The lack of domestic space laws has made India vulnerable and a victim of loopholes in the international treaties. Like I discussed, the liability convention has hit hard, has hit India very hard. Recently, there was a de planned deorbiting of a space object of Indian origin. Unfortunately, it landed on a uh, Japanese village and has caused damage of mass uh, levels of mass scales, both of human and na uh, property nature. Now, with India being a signatory to the Convention of Liability, India is obligated to compensate for any destruction of property in village or for the mankind. Now, again, like I mentioned, since there is no calculation of the quantum of recovery, Japan has been trying to extort funds in the name of damages, recovery of damages, actually exceeding the amounts of damage. Had there been a domestic law or a national policy that addressed deorbition of space debris or how to bring in space debris created by India itself, the verdict could have differed. India finally in 2017 introduced the Space Activities Bill. One of the draftsmen, Dr. Sandeepa Bhatt, is closely known to me. And discussions from him have brought in these opinions in my regard, in, in my understanding. The bill has been drafted and it's pending approval, of course. And is, the bill has been brought in to promote, support and regulate space activities in India 
by allowing private and non-governmental agencies to involve themselves in space exploration. Uh, the act brings about licensing, the act brings about penalties, and the act brings about imprisonment. One of the examples is that if any person, entity, or enterprise fails to obtain a license and commercially exploits space, I don't know how, but commercially exploits space, they are liable to a fine of up to a rupees one crore and imprisonment of up to three years. There is a presence of the space specter in our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi's Make in India campaign. It needs to be exploited. It has 100% foreign funding, uh, investment. Uh, it, 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 there is space for 100% uh, foreign direct investment. And India, as you all know, is currently gearing itself towards having its first manned mission in 2022. It will be prudent and in interest of India to have a space legislation before that. It will take India's move from dependency to self-sufficiency in terms of launching adeptness, make it the world's launch pad. Cost-effective space programs have attracted uh, other nations. You must have seen the movie Mangalyan and the amount of grants in terms of funding where Akshay Kumar was able to you know, bring in a cost-effective uh, space mission, etc. Now, as all that seems very, very interesting and intriguing, such attempts have to be governed by a national space legislation. Government cannot arbitrarily cut off funding and there cannot be arbitrary demand of funding from the private sector itself. It is true that India has taken baby steps towards formulating space activities bill. It is pending and it is going to dismantle the government's monopoly step by step. The bill for more discussion applies to the whole of India, including citizens who are engaged in any space activity outside India. A person can undertake commercial space activity only pursuant to a license. The term person has been defined widely and potentially includes non-residents also. Like I mentioned, 100% foreign direct investment is permitted. Uh, accordingly, the bill shall provide that license to indemnify the central government from claims brought about against the government in respect of any damages. This is what was needed at the time when Japan launched its uh, claim. Furthermore, there is a requirement of a robust intellectual property regime. However, uh, under the bill, it is under the government's complete uh, authority and authorship, all IPRs under this. Now I move to my final and closing remarks for today evening. The next slide is that the journey that the world has embarked upon together in attempting to venture space exploited for the greater good of the man has brought about a race amongst the nation. But as juvenile as one could be in the matters of the galactic world, it would be naive to believe that we have submitted this aspect as well. The laws and the legal framework only tend to monitor the activities that man today can think of. However, it is benign of us to think always that man is the most intellectual being in this universe. A quote from President John F. Kennedy at the inauguration of the Uncopus in 1961 is that there is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. It's hazard, however, are hostile to us all. What would one do or which degree should one pursue to specialize in space law? Could you suggest books or acts to read to get a thorough knowledge of it? Okay, this is interesting. Uh, in India, the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences in Kolkata uh, has a postgraduate diploma in space law. Uh, you could take up that. Degree per se, there, there is an international institute of space law in the US. Uh, there are 
uh, institutes in France, in Russia, in Australia, their uh, requirements, criteria are all, are all put up obviously on their website, but uh, differ largely. So in my understanding, uh, uh, those would be the institutes. Books, uh, there, are, there are several books. The website of NASA itself has uh, a lot of uh, documents available. Uh, I would like to address this issue at a later, uh, address this question at a later time uh, through email. I would bring out certain reference books which I have used in my uh, studies and research and would like to share the details. The names aren't really at the tip of my tongue right now. So. Uh, one more question, Harsh, is what would be the stand of Indian government on coming in contact with a UFO? Is it possible to be governed by space law of the country? And can it amount to secrecy by way of any law? It's a very interesting question. Very interesting question. Well, uh, UFO, unidentified flying object, would be a situation that would... Uh, attract attention internationally. If there is an Indian involvement or Indian government involvement uh, under, the, under the understanding of outer space and all its celestial bodies being the common field of play or sovereign uh, or uh, I'm sorry, province of mankind, India would be under the obligation to di disclose it. About its applicability or effect uh, to Indian space law, as of now, in the draft bill from what I've produced and what uh, remains to be uh, codified, there isn't anything. Thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity.